everybody, this is David having a chat on a Friday afternoon with Rad Saraj. It's a pleasure to see you, mate. How you doing, Rad? I'm great, David. Good to see you and so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's awesome. Um, we're going to have a fantastic chat, loads to talk about. Um, and I think the first thing that I'm interested in is where do you get those dance moves from? Who taught you to dance like that? Because we had a boogie down in Toronto a couple months back. <laughs> um, it's such a, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> I, I, it's a, somebody who's been awkward and anti dance for a long time growing up, only because I didn't know how to dance. And I was like kind of envious of everybody who knew, had natural rhythm. Mm. Um, yeah, I just like, you know, when I, when music comes on, I love music and I just allow it to take me over. And whatever comes out, as ridiculous as it may look, sometimes it's fine. I enjoy it. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You got it. We're going to talk about music today, talk about loads of things. You are a very eclectic gentleman. Um, thank you. I think a nice place to start is on an identity level. Um, so keeping in mind, folks, that Rad is the founder of both the Minority Trip Report and of Mission Club. So I'm interested around Minority Trip Report. We're going to cover that a lot today. You talk a lot about identity, culture and race, uh, personal development, experiences of growing up. So I want to kind of just put you on, on the kind of warm seat uh, for your identity as a Bangladeshi Canadian. Can you just start talking through how has that evolved and uh, kind of informed your sense of self and meaning in life as you've gone through the stages of, of being alive? Wow, uh, super hot, deep question from the very beginning. I appreciate Boom. that. Boom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think identity is such an important thing for every person, I think, on the planet. Is Some of us have the privilege to contemplate it, others don't. And some of us, you know, haven't come to prioritize or like sort of integrate uh, different parts of themselves. So I think for me, it's been an ongoing journey. Um, I feel like I've, after, like, I'm, I just turned 38, and I think I finally sort of started to integrate in a wholesome way all the different fragments and pieces uh, of, of me and my life and journey. Uh, just for some background, I was born in Bangladesh, uh, and when I was two, my father was a migrant worker in Saudi Arabia, so me and my mom moved there, my brother and sister both younger than me, were um, born much later on in Saudi. Um, grew up in Saudi for 14 years, and then when I was 19, moved back to Bangladesh when I was, you know, um, when I was 16. And then a couple of years later, got a scholarship, moved to Canada. And so in terms of identity, it's always been a moving target. Uh, I don't, I can't say I've always had a... Um, a very sort of cohesive identity, uh, sort of uh, identity, something that I can grab onto and say, "Oh yeah, I'm Bangladeshi," or uh, "No, I'm Saudi." Oh, I'm I'm sort of like Westernized. Oh, I'm Muslim, uh, or I am like you know atheist or whatever. I felt a range of these things because I was always I felt like at the margins of things, and I was always a sensitive kid growing up. Um, I didn't know that at the time, um, but I was like you know I loved music and art early on I love reading quite a bit and so I think like identity to me is has always been very important but I didn't know how to I didn't have the language and I didn't have the the need I didn't always understand the need to integrate different parts of you and ultimately I mean if you look at um, Fadiman's new book I think it's called the symphony of selves or something the idea being that every human being is actually a, you know a symphony of many multiple selves and uh, Unless you try to integrate it, you always have to suppress one power. One part always over, you know, overwhelms the other, and that's where you have all the problems. Um, and we all have that. You know, we always battle. We all battle with that. Um, so from that perspective, I think you know, again, I, I, I was I was born Muslim to a lower middle class family. My father and mother, like you know, there was a independence war in seventy one in Bangladesh where uh, West Pakistan split up from East Pakistan. East Pakistan is. I mean, Bangladesh used to be East Pakistan. Um, there was a war. My father was part of that war. My 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 grandfather from my mom's side was also a intellectual rebel um, who was uh, kidnapped and then tortured, and he ultimately succumbed to his wounds. 
wounds, um, you know, having that that legacy, uh, poverty, seeing a lot of poverty, mental health issues um, as a result of that. Um, then growing up in in Saudi Arabia, in, in what is a very, on one hand, an extremely diverse melting pot of the entire world. Like it's 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 always been like a tra- you know a trade route. Um, there's a port there. Um, and then sort of growing up in an English-speaking school uh, that was, funny enough, was actually aimed for lower middle-class kids. But because the education standards were so high, all the rich kids moved in here. So growing up in that sort of multi-class environment, uh, but at the same time seeing an extreme amount of xenophobia, anti-migrant, anti-South Asian sentiment, and being very, very aware of that day in, day out, seeing that. Um, while being quite westernized myself, like, you know, um, Saudi Arabia at that time was very, um, it was, everything was banned, essentially. You know, although we grew up in the port city, which is relative to the rest of the cities in that country, you know, it, you know, it had, it had, it, because of port city, all port cities tend to be a little more progressive. But I, I say that with a grain of salt, it's relatively progressive. Um, but, you know, I hacked my radio to get some rig, rig D stuff, 40s. And listening to Western music, and then um, not proud to say I was a broke kid, so I had to shoplift to get my Guns and Roses and uh, all my uh, all my music because um, I had no money. Um, so being aware of that sort of like you know uh, that part, and then of course coming to Canada as an international student for the first time, being in North America um, and all that, and then I'm I don't know if we'll talk about this later on, but. In year three, I had this insane opportunity to become a host for Much Music, uh, which for a brown kid who's never been to North America for the first time, traveling with a huge rock band across the country and seeing Canada in a way I think most people haven't seen. It was just insane. And that's, and so like, this is just like a long trend uh, or I guess like a, a, a thread in my life where I've always been on the margins, but I think I'm finally sort of weaving it all together and what feels like a cohesive identity. Beautiful. That's a perfect uh, opening. Thank you, Rod. And maybe just to pinpoint the time that you left, um, you were back in Bangladesh and you moved to Canada. First time going into the West, I guess. Had you been vacationing ever, like in a Western country or? No. no. I, um, I, all I knew about the West was watching really terrible, in Saudi Arabia at least, watching really old <laughs> western movies um but in Bangladesh it was a lot more liberal so we did get all the newest movies and stuff like that but that's all i saw was all i knew about the west was from movies and music and stuff like that at what point did you realize that you wanted to stay in the west or or canada or ha- did you or have you made that decision that's a good question i i don't think i i d- decided to move to the west so much as so i wanted to escape my really Bangladesh was the move for me was really really difficult I think it was a seminal point in my life I was 15 16 my father had lost his job I've been after 16 years of service they basically fired him one day and uh, essentially the idea was that the Saudi management because my father was moving up so fast because he worked very hard and he you know he kind of knew he was westernized himself in a lot of ways because of his own life experiences. Um, but because of the xenophobia, Saudi management refused to work under my father, who is a Bangladeshi migrant worker. So he was let go. And so and I bring that up only because in basically three weeks, my dad finally broke the news. It's like, we have, we're going to go home. And so like wrapping up my life like that, moving to Bangladesh where I had no connection, no friends, I was I felt completely alienated. I had loving friends, don't get me wrong, I had loving friends, but like I think feeling completely alienated and very different. Um, also, I was 16, had my first breakup while I was in Saudi. Um, it was it was it was really really tough, uh, really really difficult time for me actually um, at a seminal time. So the reason I bring that up is. I managed to get a scholarship. I knew that the only way I was going to get out of that, because my parents, bless them, they're they're the most incredible, loving family you could ever ask for. We were broke, <laughs> had no money. Yeah. So I'm like, I, I have to get out of here. The only way I can do that is by um, doing really well in school. And 
you know, I got into a lot of trouble, but I was always a good student. Um, and, you know, um, and I was at the same time, I think I, uh, I saw a lot of darkness from my family, addiction, mental health in my high school, a lot of darkness, a lot of addiction, lots of hard drugs that I've never seen before, you know, um, music again, culture and music. So it's like, it's the yin and yang. So much my entire world opened up, burst open when I moved to Bangladesh because I had this stuff. All of a sudden, I love music so much and I could get anything I wanted. But with that came, you know, what do bored middle class kids do? Drugs. Drugs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't mean like, you know, just smoking cannabis, yeah. everything like that. I saw all sorts of stuff. So um, I chose Canada because it's also near uh, 9 11. And my legal name is Hussein. And I refused to go to a country where I knew I would get harassed and penalized. And uh, I, I refused to put up with any more bullshit um, after having lived in Saudi Arabia. Uh, my parents shielded us from most of it, but I knew having the legal name that I do, I will be. Um, I, and I refused to do that. I said, I will, I will not. Can I swear on this? Of course you can, as much as you need to. <laughs> I said, uh, fuck that, basically. Mm. Um, I'm I'm not going through that. And Canada, it seemed like a really you know welcoming place. I had lots of friends going to Canada at that time, so I basically said, "All right, fuck the U.S. I'm not going there. Uh, I'm not putting myself through that stuff." Um, you know, I, I mean, I, of course, I have lots of love for the U.S. At that time, I was just an angry teenager. I said I will not go through that because it was it was a really tough time. Um, and I said I'll apply to Canada. I got into two schools, and I, I you know picked the one, and I decided to study molecular biology uh, and do cancer research. And that's what brought me here to Canada and decided to stay because it is a wonderful place. And, you know, I, I, I am very much Canadian, but I'm also very much Bangladeshi. Love it. Thanks, Rod. And I'm a big fan of Canada. Um, some of that is primarily just to piss off Americans because uh, <laughs> I've been here 10 years and it just hasn't clicked for me Like as a, as a culture in, in this country. I can connect with, you know, the opposition and the anger and the indignation, mm -hmm. but it's hard to connect with the actual identity of this culture and, and land. So Canada really, in a way, it feels more British, but I'm not even worried about the British piece. That doesn't mean too much to me anymore. <laughs> it's just people seem to just be nicer and, and the government seems a bit more caring and progressive and drug laws included and obviously that it's not you know, it's perfect but it just seems like a more accepting tolerant country and it's actually I think it's even more diverse than America if you look at the percentage of Canadians born overseas or born to parents that were born overseas I think Canada is actually number one in the world and they've, they actually recently set a target of increasing how many immigrants they give uh, visas to over the next I think, 10 to 20 years as a long-term intention to you know primarily help the workforce you know expand and to keep the balance in the demographic so yeah what what what's your sense as a patriotic Canadian tongue-in-cheek like what does it actually mean to you when you look at say America or you look at other countries like Saudi Arabia around the world and how people are treated and feel there do you actually feel that there is uh, a place for anyone to be in Canada and, and that they can you know, make a life uh, as you've done? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think, you know, I I don't valorize, I don't, um, I don't sort of idolize anyone or any place. Uh, I think everyone, everything is imperfect. Um, I love Canada, recognizing it's, history of abuse, racism, and slavery, all that stuff I think is important to say. I love it despite that, not because I ignore it. Um, I think Canada is interesting in the sense that it's a big, it's a massive country. And f like what, 80% of its population lives along w the foreign line parallel? <laughs> yeah. So you have a massive country, Empty. very distributed, a few core um, metropolitan centers. You know, um, I think there's this idea that when Trudeau first came, you know, to office, I mean, Trudeau Jr. came to office, I think there's a lot of conversation around, you know, what is, um, what is a, like a post national nation look like, or like post, I don't know what's the word, uh, but anyway, like the idea that, you know, not having a very clear sense of what being a Canadian is actually our strength because, you know, like, 
I, I don't know if this is right. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts on this is. I feel like in the U.S., you have to be American first. Yeah. And it's very defined in a box what being American is. You know, I don't think that's defined very, you know, very strictly in Canada. You can be, like, I can be Bangladeshi and Canadian at the same time. I don't have to prioritize. I don't have to show it off. I don't have to prove it. Um. And of course, like, don't get me wrong, by the way, Canada's immigration policy is very much geared towards anybody who has economic value. Mm, like the right <laughs> skills and qualifications. Exactly. So it's not like, oh, just come in here and stuff. Of course, we've taken a lot of refugees, a lot of asylum seekers. I think that's great. We, we, we should be doing that. We should be caring for people. We should be a standard for what, you know, um, respect for global rights and humanity looks like. Um, but it's immigration is by it's it's very thoughtfully designed. It's also learned from what's happened in the U.S. and U.K. and Australia, um, and so you know it, with that, I, what makes me Canadian, I feel, is like I think overall this idea that of of open mindedness. Toronto, as you pointed out, is the most diverse city in the world. Fifty percent of Toronto's population were not born in Canada. I think that, and you come in and there's no sense of friction. There's politics. Don't get me wrong, and there is there is tension but generally speaking even though the two or three racist incidents that i've faced were in canada after moving here not in the us um i think overall it is a very tolerant open accepting place with all its imperfections and there's lots to work on and lots to build and my thing is like if you love it make it better and so I don't, I don't, I, when I criticize it, I do it with love. Love it. And we'll come back to talking about identity, culture, race in a wee while when we talk uh, about your podcast. Uh, just taking the music piece that you mentioned, that kind of road trip ac across Canada. What did it, what did that road trip kind of give you? And, and I did a road trip when I was 19 from, um, I went from Indiana to, to New York and then to um, San Francisco. And took a month just moving around and it, it was amazing doing that like by by road rather than by air so um and you've got a guitar on your wall there so you're a musical chap what what was going on when you did the road trip with much music you said it was cool so what what is that i've never heard of it to be honest can you just tell folks what was going on right then yeah it's funny much music doesn't exist anymore but much music was essentially canada's mtv oh wow so very much part of the culture building mechanism in canada like you know back in the day you know it was it was great it was when i much more existed very strongly when i came in and if you like rock music they had fantastic music and videos and sort of all this stuff um so i never imagined in my entire like ever that i would be that i would do that you know i came in basically the idea was that i you know, i love music i went to um to see one of my f most favorite bands uh, I listened to them a lot in Bangladesh. I came in here and it was like the first concert I went to in Toronto. And after the show, um, I stood in line, you know, behind the venue because the band made sort of like the, the band comes out before they go to the bus, they sort of sign autographs and stuff. So I just stood in line. It was like maybe 1 a.m. at this point. Um, and I met, I became friends with the girl next to me and she introduced me to a record label that had a, like a street team. Essentially you go out and build excitement and you canvas and stuff like that. And in, in return you get perks like free CDs, concerts and stuff. And eventually like one of the bands that was on the record labels roster uh, a couple of years later, um, it's called finger 11 and they're a band from, uh, Burlington, Ontario. Um, and they were really huge in the 90s. And in 2007, when this happened, they had a huge, huge song. It was a huge single. It was called Paralyzer. And so the idea was that the record label partnered with um, partnered with Much Music, which again is the MTV of Canada, to do a global, uh, sorry, a, a national tour with the band as the leading sort of like um, uh, the band and they had supporting acts and stuff like that. And... Um, they basically wanted to have two people that were going to follow the band and do like this uh, a web series that was more like a road diaries, right? Sort of like you go in, you sort of build excitement. So behind the scenes, what's happening on the bus? How is it like behind stage? What is it like being with a crazy band? And they had the number one song in North America at the time, Holy bigger shit, than Nickelback. This is awesome. Keep talking. This is <laughs> a little bit like almost famous, isn't it? Kind of, but in a different way. 
absolutely that's what almost favorite and which i it was one of my favorite movies it's amazing way, i love yeah. almost Famous. yeah they were the number one band paralyzed with the number one number one track in north america for, mm. for a few weeks it was crazy it blew up it was bigger than nickelback like i said and i mean what is bigger than nickelback really even though i don't like that band but you know it was they were pretty huge and so to have an opportunity to go from Sherbrooke, Quebec, all the way from East to Victoria, BC, over three and a half weeks, where they said, you get to follow the band, <laughs> live and sleep with them, and I sort of like not sleep with the band. But like, you know, like, I don't know. Right, you're not a groupie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, all the groupie work, but none of the benefits. Um, uh, so it, it was great. And, you know, on one hand, Man, to to see a con to this, see this country in this way on on a, like a sixty foot bus, where you sort of go in and you you know you, you've seen this on TV like you go in there's like the, the sort of lounge area there's the middle section which is for sleeping and then on the back you have the crazy like you know like a four foot bong and a huge TV and video games and like uh, Guitar Hero was like huge it just came out everyone is playing Guitar Hero. And so, like all that stuff, and to see that, and and I'm just like an awkward brown kid from Bangladesh who came here on a scholarship. I, I'm just like, what the, what the fuck is this? What is happening in my life? And so, there's that beautiful part on one hand, which is crazy, just to see what a big band does, and of course, all the attention they get, and the press, and all this stuff, and and seeing the crowd go crazy, a four thousand people crowd go, you know apeshit over music and but on the other hand it was very difficult because i realized how different and how much of an alien i was you know i every other joke is about seinfeld and simpsons i'm like yeah i know it but also i mean to this day i don't understand seinfeld i i just, I just don't get it I, I don't know why people love it so much <laughs> but you know um yeah i felt like a total alien total alien i um you know it just made me if it happened, if I, if if the current me was back then, I would have handled it well. But I think the narrative back in that that at that time was like, oh wow, I'm just awkward and I'm just weird and I'm just I just make it, maybe I don't get it. Um, so it was it was hard in that way. But you know, like my theme, my my attitude, in my entire life has really been come from a place which helps you connect to people on a human level, which is humor and music and here i was at this amazing opportunity because of music so i'm like how can i relate and um i guess i can tell you one highlight that will maybe give you my takeaway to this day you know 15 years on what what i took from that entire experience was so you know the way these things go is that you basically you go drive all day and maybe you reach around like me four or five hours before the show. The band does interviews and press. And then all the way till showtime, you know, you're sort of like doing these things. You play two hours and it's insane. It's like the ultimate high. And I wasn't on in the band, obviously, but to see it to be backstage and to be taping the whole thing. I shot basically we were shooting. We turned the entire experience into a DVD that was released later on, a live tour DVD. Um, and then you pack up and you go drive and literally that's it day after day and by day four or five i was like what day is it what time is it i don't know and then you start to realize i see why people do drugs because you're trying to capture those two hours of like euphoria and nirvana in a way and then it's all it's like endlessly boring <laughs> it is so boring um but anyway, like we went through, like we started in Sherbrooke, Quebec, um, and then we were gonna drive to um, uh, BC. Before that, we uh, we had a couple of shows in Alberta, in Edmonton. So this one night in Edmonton, we actually had a night off. So the idea was we'll play the show, party that night, and the next day we'll just do our own things. Very rare to have a day off like that. So that night we sort of played this crazy gig. It was insane. And we sort of like went out to drink and stuff like that after that. Um, and it was, it was really hilarious because like it was like one big tour bus and two other side acts with their RVs, including ours. And like I said, at one, on one hand, it was like 
my life is a gift. This is incredible. I can't believe I'm here. On the other hand, I feel like I don't belong here. <laughs> I'm uh, weird and I, I, I'm awkward. I feel like, you know, nobody really wants to talk to me for beyond like, here's a smoke and how you doing, buddy? You know, it's like when somebody says, how you doing, buddy, like that, you're like, oh, yeah, you think I'm that Indian dude. OK, all right. Uh, that's, I get it. I totally get it. They're not trying to be a dickhead, but I also understand why. Um, and then like we got all drunk and then we got on the bus. Now, if you ever been to a tour bus that's 60 foot long and this is decked out, this is like number one rock band of the time. So they can afford this. You go on the tour bus, you know, they press a button part of the front end of the bus extends out. You can now have a dance floor, a little disco ball forms from the sky. Everybody's getting boozed up, right? Like <laughs> the band, basically the luggage compartment is all alcohol that they basically restock every day. It's insane. So this happens and we're having a drink and then some guy decides to have, you know, start flying a remote controlled helicopter in the, in the, in the bus and, you know, smashing into people's faces and people are laughing. And there's music playing. And, that, you know, I'm just like sort of in the corner, sort of talking, laughing, but also like kind of like kind of corner. And then and then Cindy, Cindy Lauper comes on. Oh, time after time comes on. Far out. And, and oh, you mean I the song, song comes on. Cindy Lauper didn't literally yeah. walk into the bus. No, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that'd be insane. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Cindy Lauper's song, Time After Time, came on. <laughs> and I clarifying. love that song. Mm. Um, and then I don't know what happened. Like I just something took me over, and I'm just like I started belting the song, you know, like just just singing it loud and like just grabbing people and hugging them. And the next thing you know, like there was 50 people on the bus. We all sort of like held hands and like just singing it together. And that was the moment where I'm like, whoa! I just had a connection with everybody here, you know, while not feeling culturally like belong. But here's the music. Here's the moment. Here's the the thing that makes us human. You know, and I, 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 I felt like I triggered it. I sort of catalyzed it and we all enjoyed it. And like from that point on, it was a different vibe. And so that's what I took from it. Like it was, it was, you know, you will always feel left out. And particularly if you're trying to figure out who you are and we all, we all have this, we all have this, um, just lean into what makes us human, which is laughter, you know, sadness, sharing sadness, uh, joy music art that is the real shit you know yeah love that story i love that you got the the dancing started to being that, that <laughs> catalyst and like i because yeah you're an entrepreneur you know a mover shaker getting stuff creating things that don't exist there's tons of things like i was looking at your linkedin profile which is a joy for a podcaster to look at because it's just got so much about you there for example you know when when there was that tragedy in Bangladesh with the factory fire. So you, you, you made something out of that that was positive and beneficial, uh, just you know, for the the, the industry executives to get a, a look into that. So just taking an opportunity and making it happen. Um, so and and using that word catalyst. So I want to seamlessly flow into minority trip report territory. And your most recent podcast I listened to was with Ruby Singh, um, amazing, amazing human being. And he uses that term being a, a catalyst as well. And you've got wonderful episodes. So uh, Manesh Gurn and Sherry Race um, and Chubby Corn 80 are some of my favorites I've listened to. But so well, great. for folks that haven't checked this out, it's called Minority Trip Report. And it's an amazing podcast uh, that Rad is the host of. So tell folks uh, why you did this and what exactly did you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, David. I also just want to acknowledge your comment. That's really kind of you. Thank you. Um, there is an idea here. Uh, it's, it's called The Theory of Extended Mind. Um, it's by David Chalmers, who often you'll, you know, you hear about it, talking about the hard problem of consciousness. This sort of like... A, um, overall idea framework for how to understand what is consciousness, something that's so nebulous and abstract. So he proposed this idea that it's called the theory of extended mind. And that, and really the gist of it is consciousness doesn't exist in the head. It actually extends into the material universe because abstract ideas turn into technologies 
that then impact everything that you see in the built environment. So an abstract idea through the pen or the pencil on paper that turns into policy that then drives capital, that then drives infrastructure. These are ideas, abstract notions and ideas that get embedded and that further drives behavior on a civilizational scale. And so if you think about that, then you start thinking about, okay, you have good ideas and then you have oppressive ideas. And then you have ideas that are simply do not uh, shine or cannot be shared or cannot be acknowledged because they're neglected, because some ideas are louder than others. So if you apply that to psychedelics and mental health and consciousness, you know, um, the what you get is, if you talk about mental health and healing, all healing aspects, all healing is, it's the reintegration of the narrative landscape, right? The autobiographical story. And so, but the problem is when you only have one type of story, one type of type of autobiographical autobiographical narrative that gets to be heard, that gets to be embedded, that gets to be shared, that gets to be go, that gets to go viral, and from that you build courses and infrastructure and definitions of what mental health is, and then you sort of like impose it on the rest of the world. That is a problem because mental health is about ultimately about being a human being, and then we are multipolar beings. And we are forced to be summarized in very small ways, whether by society or by systems. And so minority report is not, idea is, it's like, you know, I've, I've always been careful that it's not a diversity podcast for a couple of reasons. One is I am not a diversity expert. I'm not an equity expert. I will never claim to be. There's a lot of people who spend their entire lives thinking about these very complex issues. I will never claim to be that. That's why I don't even say BIPOC in my description. I just, I'm not, not an expert in that way. What I, all I have is my lived experience. And yes, as a person of color, immigrant, Muslim, blah, 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 blah. It's like a minority shit sandwich that I'm part of. Um, yes, I have that, but I also don't speak for, you know, um, marginalized communities. That's number one. And number two, I think the idea is to say, here are other ways that people have grown up. Here are other ways that, that people have experienced mental health challenges. Here's other ways they're reintegrated. Here's other ways that they're building something. And it is, it is to say, let's broaden the pool of narratives, not to say one is better than the other. And in the hope is that in broadening the pool of narratives, you set the beacons where others start to participate. And so then from that, going off the theory of external mind idea, you get more solutions, you get much more accessible infrastructure, and ultimately, you can say, you get to heal on your own terms. You don't have to heal this other way or because you saw somebody on Instagram talk about healing in that way. So that's really where Minority Trip Report came from. And the I was very conscious about the double entendre of like Minority Trip, or sorry, Minority, minority Report because of that movie. And it's because I think all marginalized people um, and I mean marginalized in a very broad sense. I don't mean just color and gender. I mean, you know, race, class being the most insidious form of marginalization. All marginalized people uh, face some sort of surveillance. So it was like a sort of play on the movie, but I, you know, it was also like a Minority Trip Report abbreviated as MTR, and I think it's pretty catchy. So, Yeah, no, I got that. The double entendre. I loved it. <laughs> um. And something I've realized from listening to your show, Rad, there is a marginalized voice that is being heard, but it's not one voice, it's many. And each guest has their own voice that needs to be heard. So it's not like, oh yeah, let's just bring in a marginalized voice here because they're all going to say the same thing. Every single one is going to be completely different and evolving and complex and the richness of, of your guests and their experiences of kind of struggling with identity and belonging and kind of integrating the facets of their themselves brings so much yeah, diversity of lived reality that, yeah, the, the, the mainstream, you know, capitalist uh, control of the psychedelic 
industry and narrative, whatever you want to call it, um, needs to have that challenge and needs to kind of make space or just have its own space and everyone else um, can create space for each other to do it in a different way. That's at least how I'm thinking of it. So I guess a question might be recognizing the diversity of these marginalized, underrepresented voices. Have you as the host identified any shared voices or any um, kind of commonalities in what guests are talking about in their lived experience? Yeah, and I, I, I'm so grateful you actually said that because I've very intentionally um, wanted to veer away from looking at marginalized voices as monolith. Because, you know, society is easy to divide and, and sort of polarize and consumerize and, you know, capitalize on if when the stories become minimized into little boxes. You know, being a person of color, being a minority, being a marginalized person is not being like that thing. It's that monolith, you know. I don't personally like diversity panels because I think if your audience is diverse enough, you don't need diversity panels. And it's become, not, from, from going a place of empowerment, it's become this thing that like, oh yeah, just have a diversity panel, it's fine. Do it on a Sunday morning, nobody will show up. But yeah, we had a diversity panel, it's great. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So I really, really, I'm, I'm so glad to hear you say that and that sort of comes across. Um, it's interesting, you know, like my guests are just fabulous people, you know, like Ruby Singh, powerful. You know, you mentioned Manesh and Sherry, this incredible Chubby, AD, Chubby Corn 80, uh, Javed Jock, Kim Haxton and you know like um, one of my guests was also Skander Ben Hamda who was part of the Tunisian revolution as a hacker you know and run, now runs a web3 web3 startup <laughs> it's just wild you know but like I think fundamentally though what I what I what I um, really resonate with is just stories of trying to people trying to find themselves you know people trying to find themselves understanding they've they've covered or hidden or lost parts of themselves through growing up and having to fit in certain ways or feeling neglected or feeling unheard or feeling invisible. But also what's really empowering is that what did they do in response to that, right? So like, um, you know, Manish talks about like, I felt like a weirdo, so I really dove into books and really fed my mind. And I think that I resonated with that a lot because that's what I did. You know, and again, I, you know, nobody was trying to make me feel like, like nobody's trying to push me to the to the to the side or anything. It's just I felt that way. I just felt because I, you know, I was again maybe fairly sensitive sensitive kid, but also I loved art and music and books a lot. So I would I was very used to spending hours just doing that. And but you know, I always knew that my intellect was what I wanted to feed. I wanted to be fucking smarter than everybody else. I wanted to be well-spoken. I wanted to be articulate. Um, and I wanted to be able to hold my own with my own ideas and, and express them in a way that was, that, that stood their own ground, you know? And I resonated with that, a lot with that because Manesh, that's, that's sort of where he put his effort. Uh, and every one of my guests had that similar story where they put it into music or creation or traveling or cooking or whatever that is it's like the creative energy stayed somewhere and i think ultimately i think the th the common theme with all my guests is having this sense of defaulting to optimism in a way being open-minded enough that the hard times didn't overwhelm them even though a lot of them had very challenging times and i did as well but the you know to your question, th these are all human things, right? Yeah. It's not because they were people of color or down more. Just human, just human. Yeah. Thanks, Rod. Hmm. I think the next question I want to uh, throw at you is, as the guest, uh, as the host, sorry, of the show, what's it been like for you exploring your own identities and kind of processing your own stories that you share liberally on on the podcast? What has that been like for you? kind of coming from that place of identity, culture, kind of facets of self and kind of, you know, development of, um, yeah, your your place and perspective of your role in life. So as you're speaking to more and more people each each week, 
What's it done to you, do you think? What's your integration journey being the host of that? <laughs> it's funny. You know, I, I, I thought about this idea. I, this, the, the Minority Trip Report name hit me in the shower like in February, and I was in Calgary at that time. I actually had moved away from Toronto, didn't plan to come back. Um, and then, you know, but I didn't launch till September this year, so many months later. Um, so like seven months later. And, uh, you know, yes, I moved back to Toronto. I got engaged and all this stuff. But at the same time, I was like, fuck, why can't I, why can't I release this? What's happening? Like, and the most interesting part of this, one of the most important things is that I, my entire life, I thought my, I sound like shit. Like, I thought I mumble a lot. I, I you know, I thought I stammer a lot. I get tongue-tied. That's the way at least I heard my voice in my own head. So, to, to now have to listen to every episode where I'm talking and I'm going like, oh, God, cringe, you know? <laughs> that, was an, that was a whole exercise in self-development itself, to be able to tolerate my own voice and my own sort of inner monologue around how I sound was really, really tough, really challenging, which is why it took me months to get over that. Um, but of course, like the inner critic is way harsher than how people see you and how people hear you. So that's number one. That was really interesting. Um, but I think the more um, ever-present idea now that every interview that I do is that I feel really grateful to feel to to actually offer a platform to someone else and not feel like I need to monopolize, not feel like it's about me. I don't have to make it that because I don't feel the need for it. I feel at peace with who I am in all my flaws and idiosyncrasies and my neurotic nature i feel at peace with myself not accepting it but i'm at peace with it like i will whatever inner conflict exists it's part of the journey and to be able to give that platform wholeheartedly to someone else and really appreciate that they trust me in sharing these stories so much what are very vulnerable stories um that's been huge that's been huge you know to prove to myself that okay i'm at this place where i i feel at least you know, there's there's holes everywhere, but I'm somewhat I feel wholesome, um, and uh, that I'm at this journey where where I I, I can give that without envy, without uh, neediness, without having to prove to anyone anything, um, and that wasn't always the case. So that's what sort of like some of what I've excavated so far, and ultimately, really, it's just gratitude towards every to to anyone that comes on the podcast, and I think, and they share their stories and and. They trust me because nobody's ever come back to me and said, um, yeah, maybe I don't want to, I don't want that podcast to be out or cut this place out or cut this thing out. A lot of my guests have said, wow, I never expected to, to share what I just did. I don't, I feel great. I feel really happy that I talked. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's really great. It's a good feeling. And whatever this goes, I don't know if it's an experiment that'll die like tomorrow, but like, honestly, ultimately, it doesn't matter. It's just like, I think. I want I want it to be heard, of course. I want it to I want it, I want people to come to the podcast. I want it I want it to be self sustaining because right now it's completely self produced and self funded. Um, but at the same time, if it goes away tomorrow, it would have been worth the effort. Beautiful, yeah, I I love it as you can tell, and I hope it's Thank here you, to David. stay. I really appreciate that, man. Yeah, it's really important, and, and um, I want to share something personally that I don't think I've ever shared with our audience before. Um, around my identity so from listening to your your uh your show minority trip report it made me think about on a meta level we are all minorities we all have a part of us that is a minority in ourself um so there's a part of us that isn't integrated within ourselves so that is a minority part and looking at you know internal family systems you know we've got those those wounded parts of ourselves and, you know, the synthesis of the selves is what um, Jim Fadiman talks about and no bad parts is what Dick Schwartz talks about. So I feel like I have parts of me that are a minority that I don't share with the world. So for me, my, my two big ones, I look like a white guy, I can pass as that, and I've had a lot of privilege because of that. I'm a Jew, so I've always been a Jew, and that's always been something I have struggled to integrate and to live with. Um, and I've had different ways of, of being a Jew 
sometimes denying it and hating it. And right now I'm loving it and I'm kind of dancing with it, but it's gone through that process. And also I'm bisexual and I've never said that before publicly until like just talking with you now. So I, I feel like I want to say that. And, you know, my wife and I have, have talked about that and what it means. So we've got these identities that we struggle with parts of us that how does this fit in with the other parts of me or my community, my friends, people that I work with, people that go to the synagogue or the, you know, the mosque, people, you know, <laughs> that I'm talking on social media with, do they know all those parts? Or is it just this one little avatar part of me that, oh, look at that part of me on LinkedIn. Yeah, that's, that's a really nice part of me. <laughs> but so just, and I guess I'm in, really interested to, to go with you on this one, Rad. When we look at the minority parts of us, these parts of us that need healing, need love, need light, need expression, need, you know, connection with others. It's it's never ending, in a sense. So I don't know how to turn that into a question, right? But just this idea of minorities <laughs> and having these really important um, aspects of self as well as the universal self, kind of the collective unconscious, the, the kind of human experience. We can't truly see each other as we are until we've seen who we really are, which includes our minority parts. That's really so beautifully said, David. First, I, I, I want to acknowledge that. Thank you for really sharing that moment with me. Uh, that's really special. Um, and I'm actually quite curious because I, I often um, joke that a lot of my close friends are Jewish and there's a lot of similarities between growing up in Bangladesh and being brown Bangladesh especially it's Bangladesh is not like India or Pakistan it's very different in the way that I think we've we've been split up and splintered across the world as a diaspora uh, and Jews are very much the same way it's not one kind of person you know the multi-racial multi-ethnic very broad and a very very old culture right it's a and uh, I appreciate that, you know, at least my from my Jewish friends, um, you know, the, relating to family and but also humor. I think humor is the one the way I've connected with so many of them. So I'm actually curious to hear, and maybe this is an invitation to you to be on my podcast so we can talk about this. <laughs> um, so that was really uh, thank you. I appreciate you sharing that yeah. part. Um, thank you. Was the question how do we integrate? like the minority parts of us? Yeah, I think we could talk about integrating the minority parts of self and mm. of culture and the role of psychedelics. Let's, let's start to bring that in because I think that is one of the unifying factors yeah. of minority triple people's personal experiences with psychedelics to help them on their journey of integration of parts of self. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think, And I, I do feel like psychedelics in this way have a big role to play. Now, I, I want to say everything that I'm saying with... with just the premise that I don't believe psychedelics will solve everything. And it is not a silver bullet. It is not the end all be all of everything. It is just a tool. And it's a very powerful tool with a long history and legacy and heritage. Um, with that said, I do feel, I think human, humanity, people, again, we have been summarized. Like, you know, this, this actually saying is from um, Naval Ravikant, who's the founder of Angel List. And I think he's like a, he's a philosopher at the end of the day. And I, I love everything that he says. And so he has this one sort of, I'm paraphrasing, he basically says that we're, multi, uh, we're multipolar beings but we get summarized in pithy ways because of life and systems and societies, right? Um, you know, all I think all ancient cultures respect, uh, have some understanding of some way that you do have the violent self, you do have the angry self, you do have the happy, lusty self, you do have the loving, childlike self. All these things can coexist, but because of industrialization and this particular format, this sort of, um, cut and paste format um, that sort of like taken over the uh, entire civilization of humanity at this point. You know, you can see now at a civilization level the problems with that, right? And then, of course, you add on top of that uncertainty. You know, there's this, there's this like weird paradox of like on one hand, 
it is probably the most prosperous time ever for humanity. Yeah. Ever since humanity started. On the other hand, it feels the most uncertain, dubious, dangerous, um, complex time we've ever faced. How do you how do you juggle that paradox? And I think this is where I think identities are and minority identities in particular that are, that feel suppressed really play, play a part in how you ex, you know experience the world, whether it's anxiety, depression, PTSD, and so on. Um, and I think psychedelics have they they do two things, right? One is like having a temporary openness to to getting a god's eye view of your life and all the different comp- and fragments of you. So you have a you have a part that is elevated above the body and the mind and the consciousness and seeing and observing yourself and all your 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 truest nature and your truest needs and wants and desires and so on. Um. And I think for with people who are on the margins again, whether you're whether you're Jewish, whether you're bisexual, whether you're a person of color, whether you're an immigrant or whatever, the parts that you suppress the most all of a sudden find light. Right? They can be seen. That's where the light gets in, right? And and then temporary that temporary visibility to all of a sudden seeing that part of you without judgment and being almost agnostic. Agnostic, sorry, to, to, to that those parts is powerful. You're like, and of course, then depending on the container you create, you can attribute too much importance to that, right? I, you know, sometimes like psychedelics don't actually give you insight; it just makes you think you have insight, but it's really bullshit. And that's okay; that's part of the journey, right? Yeah. That's where you need the container, and you need people who are guides and and teachers and and community folks who can tell you, like, no, it's just whatever. It's you know, you're just tripping out. And that's it. You're not really a god. You can't just become a shaman because you did, ate ayahuasca or did ayahuasca once or something. You know? um, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think to your question, is it's, it's a matter of giving those minority pieces or parts of us some acknowledgement. And I think that's all it is, really. And then, of course, you get the integration part, which is where the container and the community becomes so important because then it doesn't, it's not transient. It's, it's, it's permanent work in progress at that point, right? Yeah, and I love that you're saying these minority parts contain light, and in a sense, what what I'd like us to kind of bring into this piece is what is darkness? And for me, you know, per- personally speaking, depression is darkness. So that is really heavy and really sharp and dark. And you know, my intergenerational trauma as well is very dark and sharp as well. Um, so with the the dance of light and dark within us and you know they them all being um real would it be okay if we went a bit more personal right into some of your experiences uh, around healing and growth and and psychedelic experiences that have been part of your your journey including any kind of mental health um kind of psychedelic results that you've gone through because i i understand there's that has been part of your your journey yeah, sure. I, I I don't mind talking about that. Um, I think for me, you know, identity, a fragmented identity, you know, I don't call it identity crisis anymore. It's just a fragmented identity. I think everybody's fragmented. This is what, you know, whether you have the chance to incorporate them in a way that feels wholesome is one part of it. But I think the other systemic parts of it, seeing the level of injustice from a very early age, you know, not just passively, but seeing it, you know, seeing poverty in my family in, in Bangladesh, seeing the the outcomes of poverty, inequality, and addiction, and undiagnosed mental health, and all this stuff, and not just in Bangladesh early on, but in Saudi Arabia, seeing the disparity, seeing how people from my backgrounds, Bangladesh, you know, Indians, Pakistanis, Sri Lankans, how they were treated day in, day out. Um, funny enough, by people of my own color. <laughs> yeah. You know? This isn't white people doing stuff to them. In fact, they were allies. My father did well enough as long as his bosses were Westerners. And ultimately, he got let go because 
Saudi management at that time refused to work under him. How interesting. Because So, the hierarchy, again, yeah. I, the irony. Mm-hmm. It's so I recognized very early on there was class. It wasn't... Race came after. Race is a 400-year-old concept. Class is a permanent part of any human society. You know, but, but class is so much more insidious. We don't talk about it, you know? Um, so I, um, what that did to me, to your question, David, is that I think I've had fragmented identities and a lot of rage as a result of that. Now, rage, and say, I say that with, I, I, I say rage intentionally and not anger because, you know, I, I was still very respectful and courteous because, like, for me, courtesy, uh, being polite, not disrespecting anyone, treating people with dignity has always been important as values that have been imbued in me by my parents, by my family, you know, um, acting with pride, right? Not to be arrogant, but knowing that, you know, you can only get respect if you offer respect. Uh, so I, in that way, I, I say rage because A is I saw all this and I saw how powerless we were made to feel and many times because of lack of money or status or having a Bangladeshi passport. You know, I've gone into U- UAE and I've been denied entrance and the passport thrown back at my face because I was Bangladeshi. You know, shit like that. I, this, this part I actually never expressed. I've never shared ever, but it has happened. And to see that, um, it, it's you know a lot of lot of rage, a lot of anger, a lot of rage, and then of course sadness because of and melancholy. That's something I've sort of cared for a long time, and I accept it now for what it is. That it's 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 there, and there can there can be beauty in that. But you know, I, I had a lot of sadness and a lot of melancholy and rage, sort of all mixed up in one fucking thing. You know, it's like it's 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 hard to sort of tease out and say this was that, this was that, and then um, while also feeling a lot of responsibility because my parents had made a lot of personal sacrifices to give me and my siblings opportunity, like immense amount of sacrifice. So like you know, and then while at the same time going like I love music, I love art, and I also got into trouble. I was like a, a you know like a straight A student, but also got expelled and all this stuff. Like it was all just mixed up in this place, and then moving around. Um, you know, seeing hard drugs for the first time and all this stuff, and I think what it all came to a. I often joke, so the and this this touches on minorities a little bit. I often joke that the immigrant ethos is that work hard, but if you're happy, you're not working hard enough. Oh wow! Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so, like, you don't stop, basically. You just, you're on survival mode. Even if you're successful, you're on survival mode. Um, in 2016 or 17, I don't remember exactly. So I had my, I had, a, like, a devastating breakup with my partner at that time. Um, but it was for the first time in, like, 30, I forgot. How old was I in 2016, 17? Anyway, however old I was, I can't do math right now. Um it was the first time in my entire life where I'm like, oh shit, I got to stop. I have to stop. Why can't I feel joy? Why can't I feel happy? Why am I so neurotic about working all the time? What exactly is driving me? And as I, exp- as I sort of like started this exploration, I had done mushrooms before, but recreationally, but I did really clearly understand how powerful mental projections are that how everything can be a simulation and maybe it is i started to explore things i started you know explore the underground came across mushrooms started to you know i started to experience these medicines lsd mdma mushrooms all in very intentional settings um a dmt and then dmt included but it wasn't until i found a guide and a friend who with whom i experienced 5-meo for the first time in 2018, that's when everything sort of shifted in a way that to this day still is ongoing. And I think without getting into the, too much of the gritty details, I think what I've been carrying all of my life is this immense weight of both responsibility that I have to do good by my family because of the opportunity I have. And don't get me wrong, I didn't have it like a, you know, I didn't get 
presented to me. I basically got got away from Bangladesh and came here with enough money to last a year. So I had to make my way. Yeah. But I did have their support, you know. Um, and I was also like the black sheep of my family in a way that I'm the only guy who's like gone, done music and all this stuff and gotten into trouble, gotten expelled and all this shit. And here I was supposed to be the eldest guiding the way. And I'm like, what the, f- what do I tell? <laughs> what do I show my siblings? I have nothing to show. So there's shame of that too, right? So, um, so what happened with 5MEO was that I think, I think a lot of people have beautiful experiences. For me, it was not that. It was an incredibly violent, turbulent experience. Um, and yeah, it, it, it was, it was, it was, it was as if every bone in my body had broken. Wow. Um, it felt, literally, it felt the most terrifying experience I've ever had. And this is not to scare anybody from doing 5MEO, but the thing is, you got to face that. Like, I knew that going in, that something was in my flesh that I cannot intellectualize. Did it, it feel like it, just it was go. something within you that was kind of coming out yeah. and literally kind of you threw your bones as well? Yeah, mm. yeah. Because 5MEO, you have no visions. It's literally just like being thrown to the void. You know, Michael Pollan describes it as a, like a Category 5 hurricane in your body. So that was exactly it. Um, and I had two ceremonies back to back. I'm so grateful to my guide and teacher who was just, you know, we talked for weeks before I did it because I knew I, knew I had to feel like a, some, a, a strong sense of trust because I, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I had a feeling that I, something was going to go. Um, and I think what I realized happened was that, see, with anger, you can channel it. With rage, and I think with men particularly, um, and in this particular sense, I want to talk about like a cisgendered sort of um, man here in this way, straight, um, as a straight man, is it's sort of like rage like if you if you if you do not have productive ways and good ways to channel anger it will implode and and sort of turn into a stone and with rage you cannot channel rage it's like a forest fire it will burn everything in its way and i think with men often like we admire anger because we think it drives us and it did it does and did drive me but the thing is with rage there's no space for compassion love there's no space for that everything will suffer everyone will suffer because of it and my relationships were exactly a symptom of that like despite loving my family my parents my sister my brother my partners my friends there was always this you know thing which i couldn't give myself entirely um it was fear-based basically uh, but with 5MEO, that sort of rage just sort of left my body. And through that painful experience, it just sort of vaporized. Wow. And yes, now I still feel angry. I still um, feel frustrated. But I don't come at it from a point of debilitating rage. You know, I, 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 am, I have the ability to modulate and hence feed it in a way that's that hopefully has good outcomes while not sacrificing my my love and my um commitment to my relationships thank you right that's beautiful that you felt able to share that so intimately I really appreciate that mm. Thanks, David. Appreciate all right breathing you. into that i guess i'm curious as to the experiences that you've had with psychedelics and the the selves that you are kind of working through, including that kind of rageful part and the the part that is light. How has that led you to be who you are now? And who do you feel you are intending to become or the impact and the role you you intend to have in the psychedelic culture, ecosystem, space, industry, just the world at large? How are you kind of manifesting psychedelics with your with your mission kind of in your role like for example are you looking to be a therapist or to hold space is that something that you're interested in um so yeah how are you kind of deciding because you're such an eclectic chap 
kind of which path to, f to follow or how many paths to follow around psychedelic culture? Great question. Um, I always think of, you know, after having d dabbled for many years and experimented a lot, I think my perspective generally now is like, Amplify if it exists, build if it doesn't. That's sort of generally my perspective. I'm not here to add more noise to what's already a noisy space and a noisy world. Um, so really, if I can help uplift and amplify things and people and projects and solutions, perspectives that I admire, that I think is worth the effort and should exist, I will do everything that I can to do that. You know, It's not about me, it's about helping others, first and foremost in whatever way I can that feels, you know, true to my strengths and what I can offer people, you know, you know, with integrity at the center. Um, in, in areas which it doesn't exist, I want to build. And that's, you know, Minority Trip Report or MTR is one thing. It didn't exist. I wanted to build it. I'm building it. And again, whether it dies tomorrow or not doesn't matter. Um, I put it out in the world, and if it inspires one person, I've done my job. Um, you know. Uh, secondly, I think I spend a lot of time thinking about how technology, consciousness, and culture are coming together in massive ways now. I think these were very different fragments for most of humanity, but um, sorry, t technology, capital, and culture, not consciousness. Um, consciousness is obviously like, you know, psychedelics, but I think this, can, uh, this sort of trifecta can affect anything, really. is because technology now allows, it takes away a lot of the friction point about how you want to take intention to idea to action, right? Um, you know, you used to be able to, like, you'd have to basically go to school, or university for years, learn how to do something, get a job, and maybe if you had time, build something, and then spend a bunch of money for lawyers and all this stuff, or hiring engineers to build an app or whatever. I mean, chat GPT, GPT just came out. Now you just tell it, how do I build an app for this on this thing? And it'll give you the entire code base for it. Right. Crazy. Yeah. So, okay, so you take the technology piece out. Technology as a tool can now become super accessible to anyone who has the idea. Then you add the cultural component, which is the, how does the culture revolve around around the values of what we and and what we think is important. What are the true problems facing our culture and world now? You know, I think there are three existential problems in this world today: it's climate change, um, inequality, and polarization. None of these are technological issues. They're all cultural issues. And they all impact uh, mental health, I think. So yeah. that's that. So how is culture evolving to prioritize what we think is important, right? And I think ultimately culture will always go to a place where it gives maximal agency to individuals and community. All this, all this shit is about is about agency, right? Not control, agency. Um, that's culture. And then sort of you add capital. Now, traditionally, all the power in the world stem from ability to control capital and labor. If you know how to direct capital and labor, you can build stuff, you can own stuff, you can control stuff. With technology and social networks, now it's sort, of, it's sort of shifted. Of course, power, traditional power still works that way. But now you have other elements like communication and code, right? and literacy and education, which are also new leverage. So you put all these two together, the ability to influence and guide capital through social networks and pool capital together in new ways to not only give more to charity, to not only fund a not-for-profit, but now how do you invest in private companies the realm of angel investing has been relegated to very wealthy networks of people for the longest time. You know, but with things like AngelList, with things like understanding that most of the value in the market now is actually captured in private companies, not public markets. 
right? It's captured in private companies that where the investors who got the opportunity to invest early multiplied their wealth many, many times. But the majority of us don't have any access to that ever. You're not given an opportunity. But now with technology and social network and education, you can have access to that. So why am I saying all this? Is that I think you put that trifecta together and now you look at psychedelics. This sector has to be different, right? It's about, of course, solution. Of course, it should be an opportunity to build wealth as well. But if you solve a problem and get wealthy from that, I think that's good. If it's extractive, manipulative, immature, then of course not. That's different. Uh, But the idea is that how do we make sure the broadest set of solutions and broadest uh, diversity of founders, including women, people of color, who have been traditionally completely marginalized from access to capital, right? Um, You know, how do we make sure that they get they have a say? So the companies they find they found, you know, granted they're good companies and really solving a problem. I don't believe just because you're a person of color means that you deserve you're entitled to anything. And I say this as a as a as a person of color too. And people may debate me on this, but I don't feel I think like you know having a true opportunity based on your merits and not the way you look and stuff like that is ultimately where I want to go. It's we're not there yet. There's still a lot of systemic barriers and oppression but uh, how do we basically allow a crowd of people how do we allow a broad network of people to mobilize capital and and in passion and advice and talent to build new companies that have that will change the game that will address these problems that have a broader set of solutions that will be truly innovative in how mental health is being tackled and from that hopefully we get to tackle bigger solutions because ultimately fundamentally speaking if you don't feel well you don't you will not do well simple as that you know to your point about just being kinder people we have to just be kinder people first thanks rad i i'm gonna brainstorm with you now just live on air i'm remembering we had a chat our first chat maybe a year ago when we really had got to know each other a bit you know i shared something that i was kind of visioning out about an incubator or accelerator program for um, you know creators, entrepreneurs in the psychedelic space that were marginalized, underrepresented, and kind of would embody more inclusivity of the diversity of people in the space with great ideas, wanting to do something. And I don't know if that's kind of what you're now thinking. Just it's interesting that last year because you've you know you, you've founded Mission Club, you've founded the Minority Trip Report, both of which didn't exist when we had that chat a year or so ago, and. And so we'll talk about Mission Club, but that's an idea I've been thinking of is around who has the capital. And when Sherry Race, I interviewed her, actually came out this week on our, on our mm, podcast. Yeah, she mentioned she spoke really high, highly of your uh, of that interview with you. Yeah, it was great. And, she really and enjoyed it. One thing that she said on your your show, Rod, well, maybe mine, I can't remember, or ours, it's not mine, <laughs> um, with the, only 2% of capital, um, uh, you know, going to, from VC's pockets is going to... Uh, to women, or um, kind of been the, was it the other way around that two percent of no, it's women, yeah, two percent of all VC goes to women. It was less, even less than that last year. Yeah, and and uh, uh, some of the reasons for that is the lack of diversity of the people in VC. So, if there could be, a, you know, a more representative channeling of wealth from diverse folks to diverse folks, and to really incubate and accelerate projects and companies that amplify and build like you were saying what our kind of rainbow reality requires damn i'm i'm down for that yeah totally man i mean here's the thing right you have to give people a choice and then of course you have to layer on top of that first and foremost good education because without stewardship choice itself can be easily manipulated and then you just have like you know people selling snake oil and all the bullshit and psychedelic sector is not at all impervial impervable to that you know we've seen a lot of garbage um, here and it will continue and it's fine it's just like i think the world we live in right now regardless of what sector you're in you i always say like at the surface of everything whether it's culture politics music tech it's all bullshit is there's like a thin sheen of garbage you have to dig a little deeper to find the true stuff yeah 
um, that takes time to bloom and blossom and be nurtured and stuff like that. And that applies to companies or founders or whatever have you. That is correct. Less than 2% of venture capital goes to women founders. Even less goes to minorities. Black women in the U.S., this is a statistic I, I read recently, are six times more likely to start businesses and they get minuscule if at any VC at all. Now, is does that mean VC is evil? No. You have to understand the, the, the roots of venture capital. It, roots of vent, Before venture capital became venture capital, it used to be called Ed Venture Capital. In 67, I got a guy called Arthur Rock, who is considered to be the, uh, the father of venture capital. He, uh, I forgot where he worked, but essentially he met a, a number of disgruntled PhD students. Um, in, uh, again, I forgot the university. This is all from um, uh, the book called Power Law by uh, Sebastian Bailey, I think. It basically talks about how you know, venture capital became a thing in the U.S., he met these disgruntled PhD students who were working under a novel, sorry, a, a Nobel um, Prize winning physicist at the time who, despite being very talented, was very oppressive in terms of a manager. These were very talented individuals who really couldn't do anything under this guy. There was no such thing as startup. There's no such thing as venture capital. Arthur Rock came and said and basically offered mentorship and offered to fund them. That funding. At that time, there was no such thing as venture capital. All the only source of capital at that time was going to a bank, and the banks would only fund big public companies, right? And there was no way to even measure what a private company or startup would be. How do you measure their success? How do you measure their probability of success or execution? There's no metric whatsoever. Arthur Rock modeled this thing. He, he mentored them. Those eight individuals, sorry, seven individuals, I think, seven or eight, um, eventually built a company called uh, Fairchild Semiconductors. That became massively successful. The people from that company ultimately started um, Intel mm. and, and NHP. Ah, yeah. There was no such thing as venture capital. It was called adventure capital because it was untraditional. And now we're at this point of time where it's become so institutionalized that you have to think outside VC is to think you're crazy. But the point I'm trying to make is that the networks of people who model those sort of forms of uh, capital allocation and there's a new model of like sort of funding startups became wealthy and the wealth stayed within the same networks of people 40 percent of vcs are basically harvard graduates so you know if you weren't <laughs> if you weren't from elite schools and elite networks where the money just stays the same way you just the same people get to invest in startups because they have the networks and they can mobilize capital how can anything change? I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying we just need more. We need broader. So if you had models to mobilize people from across the world, different genders, different sort of ethnic backgrounds, different orientations, think about who would get funded. This is why women don't get funded. This is why minorities don't get funded because the same kind of people with the same mindsets, the same ideas about what, uh, you know, I get so pissed off when people say, uh, when when somebody an investor asks a guy, oh, you're not working on your uh, idea full time, uh, you're not serious. Why should we fund you? I'm like, can you imagine saying that shit to a single mother who is who has two kids and going like, I cannot work on my idea because I have to put food on the table, and you're telling me I'm not committed? Are you serious? So this is the whole thing. It's 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 a it's going back to the theory of extended mind. Who allocates capital? gets to decide what it gets spilled, gets to decide what values get embedded. I'm not trying to put down anybody. I just think we need a broader set to have a broad to tackle a broader set of problems. And by that we have to um, we have to mobilize a broader set of ingenious sort of like entrepreneurs, motivated individuals. And all we ought to mobilize individuals like us who can see it that way. And, you know? So what what uh, what structures can we create so that you can invest your time, energy, passion, capital, whatever, in whatever you deem fit that is uh, proportional to your risk tolerance, that is proportional to your how much time and ability you have. But let's have you participate. Hmm. That's really the question here. Yeah. And specifically for Mission Club that, that you founded, 
what does it do? Tell folks about it. And in a sense, are there any ideas um, that you can share here about where you want to go with it? Yeah, sure. So Mission Club, first and foremost, is an education platform. Um, and we educate people broadly first about what the psychedelic space is. You know, it's easy to throw around the word psychedelics, but really it's a very complex, broad space with lots of politics, history, science, all this stuff. It's kind of the reason why I love this space. And I'm sure like we have, we're similar in that way. It's just got so much stuff, man. It's like, it's truly a rich ecosystem. Really cool. But with that comes super complexity, you know? And when something is very complex, you can easily create hype. And there's, again, a lot of bullshit. So how do you enable someone to see through the bullshit to understand the space for what it is? You know, both the opportunities, the risk, the complexity, who is participating, what solutions do we need, what problem are we trying to tackle, all this stuff. So that's one part of Mission Club. The second part of Mission Club is just, okay, how do you create opportunities for uh, investors to find good companies to invest in? And one doesn't happen without the other. We will never talk to investors without talking about education, how much they know first, to understand also what is their motivation, what is their risk tolerance. And once that happens, you know, uh, Mission Club is partnering with Microdose, uh, which is some may know as the most prominent media company, I would say, in this space, uh, or one of the most prominent um, in this space. Um, and they're the ones who organize Wonderland uh, every year. And, uh, you know, Microdose has a global audience of both people who are interested in psychedelics, who are the curious, but who are also investors from around the world. And they want to mobilize capital on psychedelics. And so we put the two together, right? The education and the opportunity. So if you want to do more, you can. Here's ways we, uh, through our networks and our relationships and our reputation, hopefully good reputation, um, I, I hope people trust us and see us in a good light. Um, we find opportunities to help and invest in early stage companies in this space. Um, you know, Anthea is a fantastic example of what I think is going to be one of the most important as well as uh, impactful companies in psychedelics. Sherry is just a phenomenal human being um, and, you know, incredible person to, and, and vision and her team. Um, Maya Health and David Champion is another example of a fantastic company. You know, there's not many SaaS companies in this space and they, what David and the team is building is phenomenal and great. Uh, and we were we are working with both companies, right? And so the idea is, on one hand, education, like I said, and then other hand is the opportunities to invest early stage into companies that we think will not only be impactful, long lasting, but also ultimately, from an investment perspective, also, uh, you know, opportunity to generate wealth. Um, you know, for us, we our barrier to entry in terms of investment is quite low, five thousand um, um, dollars is the minimum check size and that we can do that because of the technology in the social network here it allows for scale uh, the traditional angel check is 75k and above which is beyond the means of most people yeah but even for us like just because you have 5k doesn't mean we will take it from you because there is something to say about like it's a very 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 risky proposition so you have to be able to to tolerate losing it actually <laughs> so um with that said, I mean, we, we're very careful on who we work with as well. So that's what the, And then MTR is the final piece under that, which is having a way to mobilize and impact the culture itself. Great. And and yeah, just to, to tell folks that might not check the stocks right now, we're in a bear market in case you, you didn't know. And it's really hard to get capital right now. And the psychedelic companies uh, that have gone public virtually all of them, or definitely the significant majority, you know, are down and way down from where they have been in the past. So capital is hard to come by, which probably means for those folks that are kind of more minority voices, it's going to be even harder right now to raise money. Um, and maybe I can just squeeze in because we've been talking for ages. I'm loving it. But a question like from working with our students here at psychedelics today particularly on the vital course a 12-month course we've got some ceos of companies there and founders of companies um lots of clinicians therapists journalists and they've got great ideas they've got great energy and something that we're trying to th to help them with as, as a team 
is how to support their getting from this kind of education and training uh, program and taking this community that they're now part of, how to kind of plant seeds where they are in their community and how to partner with other folks or how to kind of get a business plan, you know, to get a deck together, to get capital. So I really feel like if if there was um, an aligned uh, organization that has capital, particularly one that could tap into, say, our diversity fund that gave away $211,000 last year to, stu- oh, wow. to students, how could that kind of um, you know, capital impact you know magnify itself globally and you know we've got a lot of students around the world but you know one from uh nepal we just accepted on into our course and students in ukraine in lebanon you know from around the world so how could that capital not necessarily for big companies that are going to do ipos just like a clinician that wants to you know open a clinic in in her town you know or um you know a group of, of, of folks that want to build you know a network of telehealth practitioners that take our training into the next dimension i'm i don't know is i think technology is needed for that um so yeah i just yeah, some, i'd I, love to talk more about it but yeah any ideas that come about just more the small scale folks not the big companies yeah i think i mean you hit it you you hit it on the um the nail on the head here um you mentioned a venture studio Okay, so I think it's important for people to understand that just because you don't get money from a VC doesn't mean your idea sucks. You have to understand what VCs are accountable for. VCs are investing other people's money, right? And so they have to provide a particular return, and they're measured on their ability to return that because they might not. If they don't, they might not be able to raise another fund, right? Private markets are all, especially in this early stage, are all subject to reputation and 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 sort of uh, let's just say traction, right? Your history, uh, what you've done so far, what you can demonstrate. And the reason I say that is because just because you're not going to get money from a VC, you know, if they say you're not venture backable, don't think that it, your idea is not worth investing in. It just has a different investment profile, assuming that the idea is actually good, right? You know, just because you have an idea doesn't mean you can build a business. It's really, to be an entrepreneur is quite challenging, right? You not only have to like be perseverant, you have to be the ability to lead a team, to build a culture around that, to persevere over constant obstacles. And so assuming you have all that, absolutely you should have the, uh, ability to attract capital. So if you have angel investors, you know, like they will, they don't, they're not, they don't act like VCs. They act like, you know, they're like, okay, I'm going to invest in you because A, I see you building something cool and could be profitable, but also like you, you, they're called angel investors because of a higher tolerance for risk, but also they might be investing for different reasons. So imagine this because of technology, social networks, and new ways to mobilize capital, you now have a pool of capital. From investors around the world who put in like five hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, fifty thousand dollars, whatever. Yeah. And then you invest in a set of solutions and companies that come from your platform. Now, then, the 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 differentiator and what you guys have to do is education first and foremost. Also, having the keen sense to know who is actually going to build cool, uh, uh, lasting solutions. That doesn't mean you have to build Facebook. It means it, but you do have to build a lasting business because it's a, you know, six to eight to ten years journey. You know, and uh, it, you're still you still have to be good stewards of investments and capital. But I think that's definitely like there's um, actually Mission Club and some other friends we've been thinking about doing this as well. And I think it makes total sense. It's just I think I, the I do want to get across is to say that just because you won't get VC money doesn't mean it's not worth it. It's just a different means you have to tackle a different capital pool. Yeah, and I actually think sometimes it could be a compliment that a VC doesn't want to give you money because it might mean they can't get 10x. But like the, in Oregon, exactly. none of the big VC exactly. companies want to invest in Oregon because they can't get 10x multiple you know so it's going to be down to more kind of grassroots folks to raise money and to kind of pull together have cooperatives and and so that's great absolutely so they get that's more of the money themselves right? yeah 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 and that's cool I mean the thing is ultimately to be the little definition of entrepreneur is somebody who generates value mm. 
that applies to a not for profit, mm-hmm. that applies to a coffee shop, that applies to a co op, that applies to a venture backable startup, all of it. You know, so generate value, do something that is really good and do it well. That's all it is. Mm, and you define value for what it means to you and partner yeah. with people that define value in a similar way. Yeah. And, and give people choice. And that's ultimately what I'm trying to get at is that if we had choice and a broader place to tap capital from, okay, then we can get more ideas, more attempts at doing something. It's, I don't think people are, you know, people, we've glamorized tech VC as this one form of capital. Now everybody wants like, oh, if I can't go to Shark Tank, I must be shit. You know, that's not true. Yeah. Rod, hour and a half is up. I got one more question in the tank. <laughs> you got, got time for one more? Yeah, go for uh, it. Dude. Bless uh, our bladders. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Having done some research on you, because I'm a good little podcaster, and from listening yes, to your you podcast as well, you've got a love of nature, the environment, sustainability. You've worked in it. You've kind of done work around, um, you know, water management in particular, um, and you've spoken about, you know, the, the, the respect for nature and environment. I want to just end off by asking you, are there any particular places in the world where you've spent some time And those experiences were immensely transformative, beautiful, resonating with that place in that moment with psychedelics or without psychedelics. Just thinking about where in this amazing world, really, ah, you felt the land and the energy there kind of flowing through you. Wow, you are a good podcaster. What a good (laughs) question to end. Um. I think three places come to mind. Sure. Um, one is obviously my ancestral home, Bangladesh. Now, a lot of people may not know Bangladesh is a low-lying country, but it has both the, it's the largest delta in the world. So massive rivers uh, like the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, they all sort of like come from the Himalayas and sort of like spill into the sea in Bangladesh, in the Bay of Bengal. Um, and you know, when I go to my ancestral home, when my uh, paternal grandparents lived, you know, I um, I remember having early childhood memories of going to the mud hut, you know, uh, sort of I spent some years there uh, with the tin roof and the house basically completely made of mud and seeing and f- and hearing and feeling the rain, the monsoon, which is just the power of nature and water is just unbelievable if you haven't been to a country where it's basically all water. It's all water. Um, it's insane. It's just it, it, you're in awe <laughs> of how massive these rivers and how much water there is. Um, and as a shitty swimmer, there's always like aspect of just being terrified. So that's one. I think uh, Bangladesh also has the longest uninterrupted sandy beach in the world, Coxa Bazar, um, southeast part of Bangladesh. Just beautiful, beautiful place. I think that really resonates with me. Uh, the Red Sea in Saudi Arabia. You know, something about, um, I don't know if, like, I'm assuming being in Israel, I haven't been to Israel yet, but I'm assuming being in Israel probably elicits the same kind of feeling. Um, there's something about the salty, warm air hitting you in the face, and it's just like the smell of the sea. It's yeah. just there's nothing like it, hmm. and it's a uh, it's also a very very volatile <laughs> sea. You know what I mean? Um, that's number two. Uh, but I'll tell you my most recent, most powerful memory in terms of being at the helm of like just in awe. And I don't say stuff like that often because like, you know, the awe, the word awe is like overused and kind of like become meaningless. But in this particular case, it's absolutely applicable. I was very lucky, very, very fortunate to be invited by my good friend and uh, MTR guest, Kim Haxton, who is just an absolute gem of a human being and, you know, an immense sort of like indigenous leader, but a bridge builder between uh, different communities. She invited me to the first ever MAPS uh, psychedelic conference, Canadian psychedelic conference or something. I forget the name. It happened on Cortez Island. Now, I heard about this place. Cortez Island is basically the SLN of, of Canada. 
Um, it started as a nudist colony in the 60s, then became like an intellectual hub and sort of perched on the cliff overlooking an ocean in the bay with you have silhouettes of mountains in the back and the moon is shining on the water. I've dreamt of these places but never been. And I went in August this year. And on one hand, SLN is just, oh my God, all the food comes from the garden in the back. It's just absolutely just unbelievable. The people were absolutely incredible. Everybody got, got invited there. But really, like, <laughs> my most, like, vivid memory is that the water is bioluminescent. Oh, wow. Far so out. at night when you go out and you paddle or you go swimming, it just, like, you look like you have a light suit on. And the moon shining over that. And I'm just sitting there. I'm going, like, what is my life? Where the hell am I? What <laughs> is this place? And it was just, like, this absolute... Oh man, it was alchemy. It was alchemy, you know. And then sort of spending two years in Calgary and going to the mountains there, you know, it's just also like Canada is an incredibly beautiful place. But but Cortez Island really sticks to my mind, and you know, it it just tells you that you know, human beings we are always going to be violent. But if we had access to our most ancient roots, spiritual roots, um, maybe there is a hope, you know. But how do we make it? that other people can have it you know it's really hard being living in a big city and you know and i'm privileged in a lot of ways um and a lot of people don't have it you know so just yeah it's just man yeah nature can heal we know this we know this for a long time yeah and not everyone can get to cortez island quite literally because you have to get i think boats and planes and helicopters but <laughs> no one not everyone can go to you know the amazon oh, and have ayahuasca so what can we do here exactly. around nature exactly. and around healing around connection Exactly. with others exactly exactly so this is That's a world exactly. record podcast i think I've, we've ever gone this long before right i kind of suspected it and did prepare you for <laughs> it just because there's so much to talk about with you so thank you you are doing amazing work you're a wonderful man uh, and the energy that you're bringing and expressing and building and amplifying um, and the voices that you are giving the microphone to um, thank you for all that you're doing and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure just chatting with you here. David, thank you. I am so grateful, A, to know you. And you've know, just been always a very kind, awesome human being. And then, of course, Psychotex today for the opportunity and just jamming on these ideas. I've, I'm super grateful for, for being here and the opportunity. Thank you. All right. Thanks, brother. And thanks for listening, folks. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you stuck around. Have a great day wherever you are. God bless. <laughs>